Go ahead and go to John chapter 12 tonight. John chapter 12. And we're going to start reading then verse 1 as we continue going through the book of John. It says, Then uh, Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with them. Uh, then took Mary a pound of ointment and of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then said one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put there. And this is just kind of a side note here. People who run their mouth about stuff, you know, it's usually very telling when they run their mouth, you know, whatever they're running their mouth about, that's usually an area where they're a bad person and where they're not good. And usually the people who run their money the most, uh, or they run their mouth the most about money are usually people who are thieves too, like Judas Iscariot, people who are robbing God, people who are not giving of their tithes and offerings. Those people are usually the first ones to say something about how the church spends the money. And I don't know what that is. Maybe the same spirit that was in Judas is in those people too. I don't know, spirit of the devil. But anyway, just a side note there. He didn't care about the poor. He was just, he was a money grubber. Then said Jesus, let her alone against the day of my bearing. Hath she kept this for the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Much people, therefore, the Jews knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but they, that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. I'm going to stop reading there. And uh, um, first thing I want us to notice in this passage, we see here the story where Mary, she goes and anoints the feet of Jesus again. And she's, um, and if you go and go ahead and turn over to Mark chapter 14. I preached a message on this a while back, but I, I think it's worth repeating uh, a great lesson that we see here. Because when you, when you look at that, I mean, really, you know, what is the point of spending, a, I mean, taking something that expensive and pouring it on the feet of Jesus? I mean, isn't, isn't that kind of a waste of money? I mean, isn't that not being very frugal? Why did Jesus allow her to do, why did Jesus allow her to do that? And in Mark chapter 14, verse 8, same story. It says, she hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the bearing. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. When Mary was doing this for Christ, what she was doing at that moment, it was what she could do. It was all, it was all she could do. I mean, there's only so much that you can, there's, that you can do for Jesus Christ. And here she has this expensive bottle of ointment and she goes and she's like, you know what? I want to give this to the Lord. This is something I have. This is something I have that's of value. And even though it might not even be something he necessarily needs, I want to give it to him. And that's exactly what she did. And it's interesting because Jesus said that she, what she was doing was anointing his body for the burial. And something that would often be done for people whenever they, after they would be killed, you know, they would anoint their body. They would put things on there just to kind of keep the smell and stuff away. Well, Jesus didn't get any of that when he died. You know, Jesus, he died like a criminal. He did not deserve that. And those little things, you know, and I talked about it in that message, how there's a lot of little things that uh, we often do for people when they die that when you stop and think about it, um, does the dead person care? You know, when you go to a funeral and you see all those flowers, you think, isn't that nice, all those flowers people sent? But here's the thing. The dead person doesn't care. But at the same time, don't we all want there to be a lot of flowers when we die? Don't we want people to send those things? You know, when you see a big crowd come to, your, to a funeral, you know, isn't that nice? But the, here's the dead person doesn't know that. They don't care. But don't we all want those things? Don't we all want those, you know, even those little things 
that they do. We want the funeral director to be out there parking the cars, putting the flags on the car, you know, people to be in the funeral procession. We want all those little things, all those little details when we die. And we try to do those things for people we love as a way to honor them and anointing a body for a burial was something that they often did back then, but Jesus was not going to go get that. But you know what? Mary, I don't even know for sure if she realized that's what she was doing, but she was anointing his body for the burial. And it wasn't a big thing. It was something most of us wouldn't think about, but it was something that she could do for her Lord. And you know what? She didn't care about the cost. And it wasn't a waste. And I don't believe that we can be too liberal in our giving when it comes to Jesus. And I think that, I think when it, I think that's one area where it is okay to be as liberal as all get out and that is in your giving. I think that's I think that's fine. I think that's great. And so then in verse 9 we saw how much of the uh, much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. They knew Jesus was there and they came not for Jesus sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also whom he had raised from the dead. And so we see here uh, in this passage that, you know, this miracle of raising Lazarus, it caused some to be interested in Lazarus and it caused others to be interested in Jesus. OK, I mean, obviously, you know, we we're going to see here that this news of raising somebody from the dead, it went all over the place. And you would think people would be more interested in the person who raised someone from the dead than the person who got raised from the dead. But some people come that they wanted to come. They wanted to see Lazarus. There was other people that came. They came because they wanted to see Jesus. Hey, I want to see the guy that can raise somebody from the dead. He's the one I'm interested in. But some, they were interested in Lazarus. I think that's interesting. And, you know, we need to understand something that we're going to see here. Not everybody who followed Jesus was saved. We see multitudes often following Christ. But did all those multitudes stay? No, they didn't. Not all of them got saved. Some people, they would see the miracles. They wanted to see, you know, they wanted to see the show. You know, whenever Jesus was feeding people, some people, they just wanted the food. But not everybody that followed Jesus around was was saved. And so, uh, you know, uh, you know, there's many people in churches today who are curious about Christianity. You know, and I think there's a lot of people that have even kind of hopped on the bandwagon in many areas, but eventually those people are going to be gone when things get difficult because they're not of us. Listen, you know, when it comes to church, there's a lot of good things about church that are just that anybody would like. I mean, isn't the fellowship nice? Okay, and I'm not talking about just eating fellowship, but the people fellowship. I mean, you can make good friends. There's You meet good people at church. It's enjoyable getting around God's people fellowshipping it's a blessing you know uh, when people are being a blessing to you you know when they're being a friend when they can help you you know you can have people maybe help you uh you know when you're doing a project around the house you know just have people encourage you people that can call you up uh people that you can text i mean that that you know that fellowship is great and a lot of people they will come into a church because they'll see you know, the blessings that come from that. They'll see, you know, just the friendship that goes on there. They'll see how welcoming the place is. They'll see, you know, they'll get caught up in the good time that we have in church. You know, they'll, they might enjoy the singing. You know, if, if we're one of those churches, and I don't think we're there yet. I think we need to work on this one a little bit. But, you know, there are some churches, one of the most fun things in the service is the singing time. Congregational singing. I mean, people, they just sing out. And they enjoy singing those praises to God. And it's a lot of fun. And people, they come and they, they get caught up in that stuff. And they enjoy those things. And so there is, there's a lot of good things. There's a lot of pleasurable things that are a part of being in church. But you understand that not everybody that's in church is there because they're saved. They're there kind of for the wrong reasons. Some people, they might, you know, some people like, they like preaching. You know, they enjoy listening to the guy get up and tell the stories. And, you know, they, and some people even like hard preaching that aren't even right with God, okay? I personally believe that Herod liked John the Baptist. But was Herod saved? No. But you know what? Herod, you know, why did, why did he kill John the Baptist? Because Herod 
was whooped by his wife. That was why. I think he liked John the Baptist. When Jesus came, uh, and he was before Herod, you could see kind of see where Herod, I think, was kind of hoping to get a message from Jesus. I think he liked the preaching. But you know what? He wasn't saved. And some people, they enjoy watching a preacher just get up there and yell and holler and scream and rant and rave about things, but they're not saved. You know, they're there for the wrong reasons. And we see that because it's like when you look at the, when you read this story here in chapter 12, where we're going to see the triumphal entry and all these people are crying Hosanna. And then just a short time later, the multitudes are crying out, crucify him, crucify him. Like what's going on? Well, it's the same thing that goes on where you have churches all the time. They can be full of people one Sunday, tough times come, and most of the crowd's gone. Why is that? Because not everybody that's in church is saved. And I've got, I think, an extremely interesting message coming up Sunday night on that very subject that I think is going to be very beneficial. Uh, but uh, any, that, that's just a side note there, commercial for, commercial for Sunday night. But yeah, there's a lot of people in church that aren't saved. There was a lot of people that were following Jesus that were around, but they were not saved. And some of these people, they came to see Lazarus. Others were saved. Others came. They were interested in Jesus. They believed in him. And so look at verse 12. It says on the next day, much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was or, um, on the next day, much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Um, and Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remember they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. Keep that in mind. Not even the disciples understood what was happening at that triumphal entry. That was a major fulfillment of prophecy that was taking place right there. But nobody understood that. Nobody understood the significance of what was going on. But like, but wait a minute. Now look at the way these people are praising him. They're crying Hosanna. You know, they're, wave, they're waving the palm branches. Surely they understood what was going on. No, they did not. You're going to see, they did not understand what was going on when he came through there. So verse 17, um, the people therefore that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause, the people also met him for that they heard that he had done this miracle. So understand, I mean... The hype is all about Jesus right now. This is the guy that raised somebody from the dead. And so everybody's been talking about him. Some of these people are saved. Some of these people are not saved. And so, but there is, either way, there is a massive group of people here. And as Jesus comes riding in, all these people are crying out, Hosanna. Seems very victorious, sounds very victorious. And it, and it was, it was a triumphal entry but understand that when these people were saying Hosanna, that term Hosanna, it's a, it's a term of praise that means, oh, save. And what they were doing when they're crying out Hosanna, they were calling on him basically to save them. Okay? Now, the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Were these people getting saved? No, because they were crying, oh, save but they weren't asking to be saved from their sins. They were asking to be saved from the Romans. And so they're saying, Hosanna, you know, blessed is the king of Israel. Okay. Was Jesus technically the king of Israel at that time? No, he was not. And you can see why many people were getting upset by this. You know, you could see why King Herod would have had a problem with this. You know, they're calling him the king of Israel. Understand that what they thought was going on, they thought... Okay, it's time for the Messiah, and he was the Messiah. It's time for him to come deliver us, and he was coming to deliver them. But not the way they thought. He was coming to deliver them from their sins. And when they were crying, Oh, save, and Hosanna, it wasn't a cry for salvation from their sins. It was a cry for salvation from the Romans. And listen, 
We've got a, a that I'm telling you right now, many of these people that we see there waving the palm branches, we've got them in churches all over this area. We talk to them almost every week when we're out soul winning. You'll ask these people, hey, if you ever trust Christ as your Savior, if you die today, you know you go to heaven. And these people, they'll tell you they're saved. And the way they say they're saved, and you ask them about when they got saved, they will talk about how they were having this difficult time in their life and they were sick and they, you know, they prayed to God and He healed them and they survived whatever it was they had. They are always looking to Jesus for physical salvation. And I always have to try to, I always try to explain them, listen, that's physical salvation. I'm talking about soul salvation. About being saved from your sins. And you know what? Many people today who are coming to church, they're not even coming to church looking for salvation from their sins. They're looking for salvation from their sorry life. They don't realize the reason that their life stinks is because of the sin in their life. They think their problems are all financial. They think their problems are, you know, family problems. Uh, you know, their uh, problems with their neighbors, problems in this country. And their hope thinking, if I come to church, if I start doing what these other people do, then all my problems will go away. And they might even come and they might even pray, you know, Lord, save me. But they're not asking him to save them from their sins. They want to be saved from all their problems. They want to be saved from all the outside things that are in their life. They're not looking for salvation from their sins. And that's what was going on here. Now, there was some of the multitude that had it right, that believed in Jesus. But much of these people, they were crying out for the wrong reason. And so the multitude, they appear to believe in Him. But their cries were salvation, were for salvation from the Romans, not salvation from their sins. And many in the multitude... They believed in his miracles, but they didn't believe in his words. And that's, this is important that we need to get a lot of people. You, nobody denied that Lazarus was raised from the dead, did they? Nobody even tried to claim that that was fake. And we're going to see here, you know, the Pharisees, they didn't even try to, you know, say that it was fake and it was a, you know, it was a uh, trick or anything like that. What did they want to do? They wanted to put Lazarus to death, you know, and then hopefully later, you know, they could, you know, get the story out there that, uh, you know, he never really was raised from the dead. You know, here's where his dead body is. But uh, understand, you know, every, everybody knew he raised Lazarus from the dead. But the thing is, many people, they didn't believe those words. Like when he said, I am the resurrection of the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I, I think I might have quoted that right, but I'm, I'm not sure. But they didn't, they didn't believe those things and that was what jesus was really wanting to get across and so you know we do we run into that same thing out soul winning people are looking to jesus for physical salvation and they are not interested in spiritual salvation in fact when you try to talk to these people about it oftentimes i mean they have no clue what you're talking about i mean when you start talking about hey have you ever asked him to save you from your sin and it's like, and they'll, they'll say yes, but then when you listen to them, they'll start talking about their physical situation again. And they'll tell you another story about something that God got them through. And it's very clear. They don't understand. Listen, no, there is a hell and you are going to go there because you are a sinner unless you accept that free gift of salvation. And it's many of these people, it just doesn't register kind of like with the crowd that, you know, Jesus dealt with the same stuff. It just it doesn't register with many of these people, but uh, many, many, many people sitting in churches today. That is why they are in church. It's all they're all looking for that physical salvation. They're looking for physical help. And listen, there are some places that call themselves churches that they do a really good job of making people feel good. You know, they 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 do great at that. You've got these churches too that I mean they they know how to you know, really get the emotion going. And, you know, you've got these people that come and every week, you know, they're up, you know, bawling and crying and sobbing and asking forgiveness for all the sins they did that week. And, you know, by the time the service is over, it's all good. God's forgiven them. They're running around with their hands in the air, you know, praise the Lord. And then they leave church and it's right back to their same old, same old thing. And then they got to come back the next week and they do that stuff all over again. And you know what? 
some of these people, I think, just like it. Some people like emotion. They do. They love going to these meetings and having a good cry. Okay? Uh, you know, that is not me. All right. I, I, you know, I joke about women all the time. My wife's not like this. Thank the Lord. But you know, some women, you know, they, they just like getting together and having a good cry. She, she went to that, uh, ladies retreat or pastor's wives retreat. And I was like joking with her. It's like, yeah, you know, all the ladies are going to all get together and, you know, start pouring their hearts out and you guys are all going to have big cry and hug fest and things like that. She was like, I hope not. And I I don't think you guys didn't do any of that. Did you No, no, no crying, hugging fest. But uh, some some women love that stuff. They they're they're all into those things. You know, I would rather go jump in a lake, an icy lake, than do something like that. But it is people uh, they get they get caught up in those things. And some churches they know how to provide that. They know how to give out that kind of entertainment. And so people do. They come because man, I, I was terrible this week. You know, I watched all these bad movies. You know, I, I drank, I smoked, I, I did this, I did that. And so they feel bad. And so they come, they go to one of these services and they go and they get right again and then they feel good again. And once again, they're not looking for soul salvation. They're just looking for a Band-Aid to put on their conscience. You know, and it's, it's not right. It's not what Jesus came for. And so look at verse 19. It says, the Pharisees therefore said uh, among themselves, perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee and desired him saying, sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew. And again, Andrew and Philip tell Jesus, And Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the son of man should be glorified. What's going on right here? Notice how the Pharisee, like the world is gone after him. This news has spread greatly. Now, I don't know how they spread news like, you know, back then, you know, they didn't have internet back then. They didn't have TV, but the word was getting out about Jesus. And we see in the Bible, I mean, even back before phones, anything like that, I mean, word spread. We read all those stories way back in the Old Testament about how all the nations were scared of the Israelites. They all knew about what God had done to Egypt for the Israelites. And here, Jesus, he does this miracle with Lazarus, and it's it's going all over the place. And then these Greeks come along, and they're wanting to see Jesus. We have Gentiles, all of a sudden, that show up on the scene wanting to see Jesus. And if you'll notice, there was many other times before in the book of John, uh, like the story at the marriage in Canaan of Galilee, where his mother wanted him to do that miracle because they didn't have any wine. And he's like, you know, my hour has not yet come. And you see him often saying in the book of John, my hour has not yet come. What was he waiting for? Why, why does he keep saying that? But now all of a sudden, Whenever the Pharisees are saying the world has gone after him, when all of a sudden Gentiles are showing up now looking for him, wanting to see him, that's when all of a sudden he says, mine hour has come. And I believe there's some major significance in that. I believe he wanted the world's attention because what he was about to do was for the whole world, wasn't it? Okay, that triumphal entry, that did that got a lot of attention. But that was not what he came for. He did not come at that time to be the king of Israel. He did not come to rule and reign. He came to deliver Israel from their sins. He came to be the deliverer from their sins. That's the thing people need to realize. That's the thing these you know dispensationalists need to realize. That Jesus Christ, he is that deliverer. He already came and he delivered them from their sins when he died on the cross. That is not a future The deliverer has already come and he delivered us from our sins. And so he he did. He had the world's attention because what he was about to do is for the whole world. Because you know what? What he was about to do, it was plan A. It was always God's intention to pay for the sins of the whole world. And these people do, these dispensationalists, they act like, you know, when Jesus died on the cross and after his resurrection, the Jews still didn't receive him. You know, and then, you, you know, after the, sto- the stoning of Stephen, 
You had Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father because he was. if the Jews would have accepted him, he would have come right then. But we should, we should love the Jews and thank the Jews for not listening to Stephen because Jesus ended up sitting back down and ended up going to the Gentiles. And now we have hope. That's just ridiculous. That is absolutely ridiculous. Jesus, at that point, he knew his hour was come because the Gentiles were showing up. What he was about to do was for the whole world. It was plan A. It was absolutely plan A for him to die for the sins of the whole world. That's just, that's, that is a ridiculous and absolutely terrible teaching. And it was prophesied all over in the Old Testament that he was going to be going to the Gentiles. All, it's all over the place in the Old Testament. And yet people, they, they try to teach this and it is very clear this was his intention. This is what he planned to do. And so look at verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall to, into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Paul said something similar to that in 1 Corinthians 15. He talked about a seed dying and being put in the ground and then it you know, produces fruit. Same thing with us. We are sown a natural body, but we are raised a spiritual body. And Jesus is kind of using the same analogy right here. Verse 25, basically saying too, before he can produce all this fruit, he has to die. And he's going to be put in the ground. But then after that, he's going to produce a bunch of fruit. And that's exactly what he did. Verse 25, he that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there also uh, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause I came unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, this, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Notice, some people, they only heard thunder. Some thought it was an angel speaking to them. What was the difference? Why did some only hear thunder? Why did some actually hear what was said? I think it was because some were saved and some weren't. And it's interesting, too, how Jesus said, you know, when this happens, Jesus kind of says the same thing that he had said in John chapter 11 before he, uh, before he raised Lazarus from the dead. He made that prayer. And he's like, Lord, I, I know you always hear me, but I'm basically saying this prayer so these people can hear it. And so right here, Jesus again, you know, he's praying, you know, he's talking about, uh, you know, he's, he's praying and then that voice comes. And he's like, that voice, it wasn't for me. I already knew. I already knew what God wanted. I, and, but yet, it, this was for your sake, so you would believe. And this is just my personal opinion. But remember that story in the Old Testament of Elisha and his servant? And his, uh, they were surrounded by that multitude of armies. And that, uh, the servant was like, you know, what are we going to do? It's just the two of us. And there's this army. And Elisha said, they that be with us are more than be with them. And then he prayed that God would open his eyes. And then the servant, they saw, he saw what was actually there. Just my opinion. I think what that servant saw, I don't think Elisha saw it. I don't think Elisha saw what that servant did because I don't think Elisha needed to see it. I think he had that much faith that he just he knew he knew his God well enough that you know what you know we've got them outnumbered but he did he prayed that God would open his eyes so he would be able to see it and that's just my opinion I don't think I don't think Elisha needed to see it and you know what Jesus didn't need to hear a voice from heaven to know that you know he was glorifying God but but the others did need to hear it and so he that voice came for them, God just kind of showing them, uh, you know, that he that he was behind him, and so there are there's there's many passages in the scriptures, you know, where people hear things completely different, and it's because there's some who are saved, and they hear the spiritual, while the lost only hear the physical. 
Okay, and that is why you can have people sometimes, you know, a preacher can get up and he can preach something from the Bible and it is so clear to you, but other people it just goes right over their head. Well, because the natural man, they, they can't receive the spiritual things. That's why we have, you know, these Sam Gipps talking about a deliverer still to come for Israel. Why can't he see that the deliverer already came? Because he's missing the spiritual. He can't see the spiritual. These people that are always talking about the physical nation of Israel and deny the spiritual nation of Israel. Why can't they see it? It's so clear in the Bible. Well, listen, you can't see the spiritual unless you are spiritual. Unless you are saved, you're not going to be able to, you're not going to see those things. So yeah, it's going to go over your head. It's going to go over their head just like it went over the Jews' head. They weren't willing to believe Christ. And so Jesus was, he, there are certain things they just weren't going to see. And so that's why you can have, even amongst king, you know, people who I think actually do believe the King James Bible, while they can take it, and come up with things that are so contrary to what we teach. Because, you know, they might have a King James Bible, but if they haven't got the Holy Spirit, they're not going to understand this book. And there's going to be a great deal of thing, a great deal that they miss. And so don't be surprised when that kind of stuff happens. We see that all the time in the Bible where two groups would hear things completely different or see things completely different. Jesus does one miracle with Lazarus, yet some people come to see Lazarus, some people come to see Jesus. What's the difference? Some are saved, some are lost. So this is not, this is not, this is, uh, we should not be shocked when these things happen. And I know that's a pretty, pretty tough charge right there. But I don't know, I think the Bible's pretty clear on this stuff. And so. Uh, you know, don't, don't get mad at me for that kind of thing unless you got a better explanation. But anyway, verse 31, he says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And I like this verse because you got people too that say, you know, they're always like, you know, nobody can get saved unless the Holy Spirit draws them. And therefore, you know, God chooses who gets saved. Well, he says it very clear right here. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, and he was lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Y'all see that? I mean, that's pretty clear right there. Okay? And, and so, it, it's going to take at least a couple college degrees to be able to not understand that verse. And so, uh, that, that verse is very clear. Verse 33, this he said signifying what death he should die. The people answered him, we have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. That was, in the, that was in the law. That was in the Bible. That's true. And how sayest thou that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus said unto him, yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be children of the light. These things spake Jesus and departed. And did hide himself from them. And once again, these people, they, did, they, they knew certain things from the Old Testament. There were certain things from the Bible that they got, that they understood. But at the same time, Jesus here, what he was, he was explaining, because you'll notice in verse um, 31, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. What's going on right here? Because is Satan cast out right now? Has Satan been cast in the bottomless pit yet? No, in Peter it says that Satan, he walked about as roaring lions, seeking whom he may devour. What's going on here? What's he talking about? Well, Jesus, I believe he's explaining that what he was about to do would be kicking off his kingdom, which will ultimately lead to the casting out of Satan. Jesus, he, right now, he is the first thing he's got to do is he's got to deliver his people from their sin. They had a sin problem. They need to be saved. Payment had to be made. And all those who are saved are a part of the kingdom of God. Okay? The kingdom is not just a thing for physical Israel that these people are teaching. If you're saved, you're a part, you're a part of the kingdom of God. And so, 
uh, you know, this, this passage shows that the crowd and even the disciples, they didn't have any idea what was going on. Why are you talking about dying? You know, Christ abideth forever. And they should have understood. If they would have had faith like Abraham, they would have just believed it when he said that. Because remember with Abraham, when God told him to kill his son Isaac, Abraham was going to do it. And we see, I forgot where it says it, but he believed that God would raise him from the dead. And the reason Abraham believed that was because God had promised that he was going to multiply his seed through Isaac and Isaac didn't have any children yet. So I, Abraham was obedient to God, even though what God had told him to do would make it, you know, should have made it impossible for God to keep his promise. But Abraham believed God that much that he was like, you know, even though nobody had been raised from the dead yet, Abraham's like, you know what? God told me to do this. I'm going to do it. I believe he'll raise him from the dead. And so, I mean, that's the kind of faith that Abraham had. And even though the Bible says Christ abided forever, they should have had the same faith to say, you know what? Even if he does die, then I guess he'll just rise from the dead because Christ abided forever. And, but they, they didn't get it. They didn't understand it. They didn't have faith like Abraham did. And so uh, in verse 37, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their ears and be converted and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now, there's so, there's so much here I want to try to cover. But notice, first of all, you've got these people too that will say, you know, well, when it comes to salvation, you know, you don't have to pray. It's just belief. But, you know, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And here it says there were many that believed, but they didn't confess him because they loved the praise of men more than God. And so uh, I, I think right there that shows that, you know, just because you know that something is true, you know, you, you do have to confess it. And I think, I think that passage is pretty clear right there. And, you know, and that's probably, um, what's that verse in the Bible where it talks about, you know, he that denieth me or I'll deny him, something like that. Anybody quote that verse for me? I know you all know what I'm talking about, but I can't quote it. I should have had that, I should have had that one uh, in the notes. But they did, they, you know, they loved the praise of man more than the praise of God. And so they, you know, they did, and they knew in their hearts. And listen, you know, it, it's one thing to know what's right. It's another thing to do what's right. And a lot of people, you know, they know the right thing to do. I know I, know I shouldn't punch in the nose, but I'm going to punch in the nose anyway. You know, you know, who cares if you knew what was right, if you, didn't, if you didn't do what was right? You know, and the Bible says, you know, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Who shall confess their mouth, Lord Jesus. And so, just kind of an uh, interesting side note there. And then in verse um, 44, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, and whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I come not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So a couple things right here. This is, this is another example too 
a lot of the people who try to teach the oneness doctrine that you know Jesus is the Father, most of their scriptures they use comes from the book of John. And what is it that we are constantly seeing throughout the book of John, and we see it greatly illustrated here in this passage, is that you know we are supposed to you know believe. We're supposed to believe his word, supposed to trust him. And when it talks about if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, listen, there's a lot of people who saw Jesus, but they didn't see the Father. You know why? Because they didn't believe his words. And when he's talking about seeing the Father, you know, that, that's, a, that's a faith thing right there. That, that's t- once again, it's talking about faith. It's talking about seeing him spiritually. None of us have, you know, have physically seen God. None of us in here have physically seen Jesus Christ. But when you believed on him, Spiritually, we have seen him, haven't we? And spiritually, so spiritually speaking, we have seen the Father. And you got a lot of people, if I could see him, then I would believe. Well, that's not how it works. Because a lot of people saw Jesus in the flesh, but you know what? They didn't get saved because they didn't believe him. And a lot of people saw Jesus in the flesh, but they didn't see the Father. Because they did not believe his words. And so th- um, this is not, none of these verses in any way prove that Jesus is the Father. No, Jesus is the Son. He's talking spiritually to these people. If you believe on me, you believe on Him that sent me. Because these people claimed to believe in the Father. They claimed to believe the Old Testament. But Jesus was constantly telling them, no, you don't believe the Old Testament. If you believed you know, Moses, you, know, you would believe me because they, you know, He spoke of me. And so, uh, you know, you can't separate those things. And so, I, you know, I think, I think that's pretty clear right there. It's just what, what happens when you just pick those verses out to try to support that doctrine. You know, you're, you're missing the context of all those verses. This has been repeated over and over and over again in the book of John. And so that is, you're going to get yourself in trouble when you do that. But then notice, too, how Jesus said, I, I didn't come to judge the world. Okay, now that, a lot of people like that. Or people say, you know, Jesus doesn't judge. Jesus didn't come to judge the world. Okay, but he didn't that first time. The first time he came, he didn't come to judge the world. The first time he came, he didn't come to be the king of Israel, did he? No, the first, that, not the first time he came. The first time he came, he came to save the world. But the next time he comes, it will be to judge the world. Let's look at verse 47. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. You know, God doesn't care you know, if, if we don't believe his words. Jesus didn't come to judge. Is that what he's saying right there? Absolutely not. He that rejecteth me <clears throat> and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Look, now... Let's read that again. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Okay? Jesus said, I'm not here to judge. Okay? But my words that I have spoken, my words that I have spoken will judge in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Okay, so Jesus isn't going to judge, but the words that he speaks, they will judge. What does that mean exactly? We'll turn over to Revelation chapter 19. Let's take a look at him at his second coming. And you know, the trendies, they'll they'll read John chapter 12. They'll read those verses and they'll all get a good feeling, and you know, they'll all prance around in their skinny jeans and pink shirts and you know get all excited. You know, Jesus doesn't judge. You know, how dare you make fun of me for wearing my pink shirt and skinny jeans? Jesus doesn't judge. Well, let's read Revelation chapter 19 and see what it says. Verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. Not a donkey this time, a white horse. And he that sat upon him 
was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Notice that, the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. Now, what comes out of your mouth? Words, right? And what is the Bible, the Word of God? It's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. How is it that Jesus is going to judge the world? How is it that He is going to defeat the world? He's going to do it with the word of his mouth. And I don't, I don't believe a literal sword is going to come out of his mouth, but I am telling you what I believe when he comes that day and he speaks, I believe it will literally cut these people in half and blood will flow. What is he doing? Doing, He's judging them with the word of his mouth, just like he said he would do way back in John chapter 12. And notice the first thing he was saying, you know, blessed is, you know, Hosanna, oh, save, you know, blessed is the king of Israel. He didn't come to be king then. He came to save them from their sins. He came to deliver them from their sins. But look in verse 16, he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, king of kings and Lord of lords. Not just king of Israel, king of kings. And Lord of Lords, and I saw an angel standing in the sun and cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Remember what he said back there? Now the prince of this world is cast out. Once again, what he was starting that day, you know, he was starting something that ultimately will lead to this. I said, but that's a pretty big space of time there. You know, shouldn't that happen? Like, no, listen, God doesn't see time like we do. All right. God's a lot more patient than we are. And he declares the end from the beginning. And before Jesus even died on the cross, you know, he was fine with talking like it had already happened. You know, have you ever heard, you know, seen these boxers that get up there or something? They're going to, or these fighters and, you know, oh, I'm going to do this to that guy and I'm going to knock him out in three rounds. They're always prophesying all these things. And sometimes they get it right. Sometimes they do what they say they're going to do, but most time they're wrong. Well, when it comes to Jesus, if he says, this is what I'm going to do, this is what's going to happen, that is exactly what's going to happen. And so verse 21, And the remnant which were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. And so that sword that come out of his mouth, that, that is the word of of God, just like Jesus said he was going to do way back in John chapter 12, that he, um, that, uh, where'd that verse go? Yeah, uh, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. I don't know exactly what Jesus is going to say at that battle, but I think it's going to be some of the things we read here in John in the book of John. The same things he said to them back then, he's going to say it again on that day. And you know what? They're not going to do like Bill Grady says they're going to do, where all Israel is just going to get saved at that point. All right, That's just a butchering of Romans chapter 11. No, they're going to die. And they're, they're going to die a bloody death that day because they, they rejected. They they should have listened then. They should be listening now. Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Then it's going to be too late. But Jesus Christ, the first time He came to earth, He came to deliver the world 
from their sins. The Jews who didn't get saved, they didn't get saved because they never saw the spiritual. They wanted him to set his kingdom up right then. They were not worried about their sins. Even though Jesus walked in holiness for 33 and a half years among those people, they never looked at him. They never listened to his words. They never listened to the word of God and felt bad about their sin. They never, they never asked for salvation from their sin. What did they want after and that triumphal entry? Save us from the Romans. We want, the, we want to control the world. We want to run the world. Be our Messiah. Lead us to victory so we can take over the world. Not un, realizing they needed delivered from their sins. It was proven over and over and over again in the Old Testament that when they were right with God, no enemy could touch them. But they would get defeated all the time by their enemies. Why? Not because the enemy was, was more powerful than they were, but because they were so stinking sinful. And what they should have done when they would read the Old Testament is they should have said, you know what? If we just get our act together, we wouldn't have to worry about enemies. But man, we can't get our act together. And then they should have cried out Hosanna saying, save us from our sins. But they didn't do that. They wanted saved from the enemy. And we've got these you know, Christians today that are basically you know, telling Jews that one of these days, Jesus is going to come to this earth and he's going to save you from all your enemies. He's going to save you from Iran and, you know, and Iraq and all these Muslims that are surrounding you. He's going to come and save you one of these days. No, their problem is they don't believe on Christ. Their problem is a sin problem. That's only going to get taken care of when they trust in Christ. We're not helping them by saying these things to them and telling them these things. It's just not true. It's not, it's not what it's all about. And so we need, uh, the, the title of this message was Jesus Christ, the Deliverer. The Deliverer. He has delivered us from our sins. He did that when He paid for our sins on the cross. His blood, it cleanses us from all sin. And we've got, so we've got nothing to brag about there. All glory goes to Him. We get that gift when we call on the Lord for salvation. And you know, it, and listen, calling on the Lord for salvation, don't take what I said earlier in that chapter and say, you know, I'm adding works to salvation, okay? How is calling on Him a work? How is asking for a gift a work? You know, how is confessing Him a work? Okay, that, that is not, that, that, that is, there's no way that's a work. You can't prove that's a work in any way. And Jesus Christ, He does, He, he delivers those, he, he, uh, he paid for the sins of the whole world. And if we will just ask him, if we will say, Hosanna, Lord, Oh, save, save me from my sins. That's exactly what he'll do. And he will be your deliverer and you can call Jesus your Messiah. And so with that, let's all stand together.